This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. This is John chapter 3, <coughs> beginning at the first verse. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak to you of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. We uh, come to that season, that place in the church year where today uh, we celebrate what is a doctrine. It is the doctrine of the Trinity. We come to this place after, uh, after having seen the incarnation of Jesus in the celebration of Christmas and then in Epiphany, his revelation. Uh, then we go through the season of Lent and see this Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, crucified, dead, buried, but then on Easter <coughs> raised to new life. We see then in the season of Easter the revealing of who it is that Jesus is as the, re as the resurrected and revealed Son of God. And then, uh, and then ultimately he ascends into heaven to take his rightful place at the right hand of God. And he sends what is the long-awaited, promised uh, gift of the Holy Spirit, which you all celebrated uh, last week by wearing red, and the tongues of fire uh, that come down and, and envelop us uh, with the love of our Creator. And so we come today able to celebrate this, this vision now, this revelation that we've got of who it is that this God is that we, that we uh, worship as a three-person God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all of one essence, or all of one being. Um, now, uh, so we come to the place of, of celebrating the reality that is described by a doctrine, but we have a problem, and that is that oftentimes in our minds, uh, we have a difficult time with doctrine. Uh, for one thing, uh, we don't particularly like being told what we have to believe, right? We are Americans, after all. Uh, and then uh, there is this, this thing about doctrine that seems like it is abstract. It is, it's kind of you know, out there. It's, in a, it's oftentimes described in ways that it's difficult for us to get our brains around. It's mysterious. And, uh, and it seems to be related uh, not at all to the things that we do in our daily life. And so we just kind of, you know, we just kind of have a way of being able to experience what it is that we experience and ask for God to relate to us in whatever way we can. And that's not a bad thing, but we do need to be able to say that doctrine is there for a reason. 
it describes the nature of God and how it is that God relates to us. And so doctrine actually has a tremendous impact on who we are and how it is that we treat the people who are around us and how it is that we understand uh, creation and our ultimate purpose in life. So even though it's abstract, it makes a big difference. Um, I don't know how many of you are into a technology and mechanics, but there are numbers of folks among us, probably I would be included, that oftentimes see that as kind of abstract and it doesn't sometimes make sense. Uh, but I want my car to be able to run. And if some of those technicalities somehow interfere with the wiring or the mechanical systems of my car, and I go to turn it on and it just goes rah, 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 and nothing happens, I have a bad day. <laughs> so all of a sudden what is technical impinges on the way that I live. And so even for us within the realm of Christian thought, uh, what is, seems to be abstract and technical has a direct impact on how it is that we live. And so we come to this revealing of the doctrine of the Trinity. And so oftentimes, if you've been part of a traditional Sunday school class, you've thought about the Trinity and your teacher would have told you, well, it's kind of like an egg. Um, so an egg has three different parts, like a, the shell and the white of the egg and the yolk of the egg, they're all three. Uh, but it's just an egg. So it has the same essence, but three different parts. And that makes sense. Or maybe you've heard of the, the analogy of water. So water can be solid, it can be liquid, it can be gas, three different states, but it's all water. And that makes sense too. Uh, but an egg just kind of sits there. And water kind of just does what it does. It doesn't seem terribly dynamic or personal for us. And if there's anything that the Trinity is, it is tremendously, in fact, intensely personal. It intensely reflects who it is that we are because we are stamped with the image of this triune God. It makes a tremendous difference in terms of how it is that we relate to God. So think of this. It would be very, it would make more sense probably if we had uh, a triune God that was three different persons with three different sets of being, you know, three different, completely different individuals. Uh, but sometimes individuals don't get along very well together. It makes it tremendously interesting to have three different persons who have the same being, who are held together by the same essence. And all of a sudden now there is a fluidity, a dynamic that happens between the three of them that we can't see in any other analogy of any other substance or thing or person around us. There's a, a, a coherence, there's an overflow from the, from the center, the very guts of what one of those persons of the Trinity is into the other, into the other as they share one another's love and, and glory and appreciation for each other. There is a term uh, that the Greek fathers, the, the ancient church fathers used to describe this relationship between the persons, and it was called perichoresis. Now, I just threw one of those abstract words at you. <laughs> I know. But if we break it apart, it will make more sense. So the word, the, part, the first part of it, peri, means around like perimeter, around, and choresis, the root of that word, means to dance. So put them together, and it is to dance around. To dance around. So to imagine the three of them in this kind of eternal dance in which they are constantly deferring and lifting up and exalting and referring and loving to uh, each other within this tremendously dynamic process, this interrelationship that the three of them have together as they adore one another, love one another, celebrate one another, and in this tremendous circle, this dance of God's love and care, 
out of it comes a desire to be created, to be able to see this love incarnate, to be able to see this love flow out from them into what then is all of creation. And so creation itself comes from this, the overflow of their goodness and love and creative energy that they just, they just almost cannot contain themselves except to be able to share this tremendous joy outside of themselves. And so creation bears the stamp of this, of this, uh, of this interaction. Um, Tim Keller, in his book, The Reason of God, describes it this way as the, as the Christian view of the created world. He says, this, uh, this, this, um, this understanding of God, the Trinitarian God that we worship, leads to a uniquely positive view of the material world. The world is not, as other creation accounts would have it, an illusion, the result of a battle among gods, nor the accidental outcome of natural forces. It was made, rather, in joy, and therefore is good in and of itself. The universe is understood as a dance of beings united by energy binding, yet distinct, like planets orbiting stars, like tides and seasons, like atoms in a molecule, like the tones in a chord, like the living organisms on this earth, like the mother with the baby stirring in her body. The love of the inner life of the Trinity is written all through it, creation itself is a dance. This creative energy that happens as the three persons of the Trinity love and adore, lift up and encourage, are able to see and to sample the, the very essence of what it means for them to be eternal, God, glorious, holy, lifted up, exalted, and to appreciate and enjoy, to sing forever the hymn of their joy, and to be able to invite creation and us into that dance. It's a great picture that's in the, uh, that's in the epistle lesson for this morning. St. Paul, I hope at some point in your, in your time you're able to take Romans chapter 8 and just read it over and over and over again. It just will cause you joy in your heart to see what it is that the Spirit, through the power of Christ, is doing in our life. But to take the, the snippet that is part of our, our epistle lesson for this morning, um, he says... Uh, beginning at verse 13, he says, uh, For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So get this. So there's this sense of God having created all that is, all of creation, and then for us to be able to be recipients of his spirit the Holy Spirit that then touches us because of, why? Because of the redeeming gift of Christ. This Christ then, by the power of the Spirit, comes and lives within us by the, the price paid at the cross and the power of the Holy Father raising him up to new life and allowing the Spirit, uh, uh, allowing Christ by the power of the Spirit to live within us and in our very gut of guts, the bosom of who we are, to see this Spirit moving within us and raising up this child cry, Abba, Father. This is a, it's a word of tremendous intimacy, of Daddy crying out to the one who has given us life and desiring to be a part of this tremendous, this tremendous liturgy of song and movement and throb of God's love into this created universe that he has made and invited us to be a part, to be a part of that holy dance in which we are co-heirs, brothers, with the Christ who has given us life. Do you like to dance? Do you like to dance? I, I'm a terrible dancer. I like to dance, but I'm a terrible dancer. Um, and so there are those times at weddings and things that you, that you dance, and we always enjoy it. 
but there was, I, when I think of this uh, perichoresis, this Greek word, and this, and this dance that God invites us to, it, 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 it reminds me that there are, it's, it's impossible there's, to get the dance steps wrong. You know, the dance steps are always right because it is this God's spirit that is inviting us into this dance. Uh, and it reminds me very much of uh, when Darl and I, uh, we were in seminary, started seminary in Pasadena, California, Fuller Seminary. And uh, I was a student. And so during that period, the first year of our marriage, I was very busy spending whatever savings and money that we had. And so Darla was very gracious and willing to go and actually earn money. That was sometimes a foreign concept for us, um, and yet she was willing to do that. And so she went to work, and she worked in the kitchen of a convalescent home there in Pasadena. And uh, the manager of the kitchen was an African-American woman full of God's joy. Uh, but there were numbers of other people who worked in the kitchen, and they were almost all uh, illegal uh, immigrants who had come into this country to find work, uh, known, uh, mostly from Central American countries like Nicaragua. And, uh, and uh, had come to be able to find uh, work there. It's almost none of them spoke any English. There was one who spoke some English. And, uh, and uh, the work you know, got done you know, really very well, except when the immigration service came to inspect. And then all of a sudden, they were gone. And Darla and her boss was there to put out the meal all by themselves. Uh, but when the spring came, these, uh, this community of the, of the immigrants were going to throw a party, and I think it was around the season of Easter. And so they invited Darla and her husband to come and to be a part of the party. And so we went to the house of one of the uh, workers in the kitchen, and he spoke a little bit of English. And we walked into the house, and it was very spartan. I mean, it was a, it was a relatively small house. There was not a lot of furniture that was there, but let me tell you, they threw a feast, and there were people from wall to wall. And we had every variety of chicken that was possible and, and tortillas and all kinds of, you know, just kind of Central American feast, festive food uh, that was there. And then uh, when everybody had eaten everything that they possibly could, somebody brought out a boom box. And, uh, and so they brought it over to the corner and I'm sure they had cassette tape and put it into the boom box. And suddenly this Central American music just filled the air. And you could not only hear it, but you could feel it. Just the throb of the beat of the music. And, uh, and so people were at lunch, you know, they were kind of sitting, but all of a sudden they would kind of feel the music and <laughs> gradually people would begin getting up off of the floor, or sitting on the floor, they would stand up off the floor, off of the furniture, and, and they would begin to move in terms of the rhythm of the music. And so soon people would just kind of reach out and grab the hand of the person that was next to them. And, and everybody in the room, from the, from the oldest, the Grandma Tita, who was in her 90s, I'm sure, to the littlest of the kids, were there in the room, just kind of gradually beginning to pulse to the movements of the music. And they would hold hands and begin to move around the room, just kind of in one direction, and then in the other, as they felt the pulse of this movement of celebration for them in this foreign country, celebrating the gift of life and community that they'd been able to receive together and to celebrate it. Now, we, we didn't speak Spanish, and they didn't speak much English, but this was a language that was far deeper than any human construct. It was, it was, it was resonant at the very deepest parts of who we are just as human beings, the throb of celebration and community and gratitude and love and joy and contentment to be able to be together. And then all of a sudden, the, the economic disparities just faded in terms of being able to just appreciate the gift that God had given um, to us. And it's just, it just was amazing in how just a, inclusive it was in terms of being able to invite, I, I, you know, they knew Darla, and so they were glad to be able to have a relationship with her and to invite her in. But, but I was, the extension was invited, was made to me. And so I was able to go and to be able to be at that party and, and just enveloped by their love as if there was no difference uh, for us at all, even though we had only just met. The throb of this tremendous celebration of song and of dance and of love and of joy and community and contentment. As the community of Christ, we are filled with the power of God's spirit. And God's spirit desires to envelop us, to surround us with his love. 
with the beat and the throb of his goodness, the desire to be able to celebrate all of the things that he's given to us as the God of all creation who has sung into the place, the stars and the planets, and has allowed everything to be able to sing his glory, to lift up his praise, because it gives us our deepest joy to be able to participate in this dance as we go through the, the, uh, the events of every day, never losing sight, never somehow setting aside the ear that listens for the tone of his song of love. Now, I suppose it would have been possible, hard, but possible, for me to be able to say there in that living room, no thank you, no thank you. So I'll just grab a chair and put it up against the wall and just kind of sit here and watch everyone else dance. And maybe frown at them, or maybe um, you know, be threatened by them, I can't dance. Or, uh, or maybe feel like I was above it all. God gives us that opportunity to be able to put a chair up against the wall and to fold our arms and to, to wait until it gets over with. But it's not what comes naturally to us. There is this opportunity for us to be able to listen to the deep voice that's within us, that comes to us from before we were born, that resonates through all of the created universe, that invites us into the song, into, into the dance of God's eternal love, and to be able to know that we participate in it because of the spirit that comes up within us, that gives us the very presence of Christ, and we sing together to our daddy, our Abba Father, the one who has given to us life. And we, we move according to the, the impulse of his love. And we give him gratitude and thanks and celebrate all of who he is in this world. That's who we're called to be as part of the church. And to be able to know that that dance goes on. We experience it today. We experience it tomorrow. We'll experience it a year from now. And we'll experience it for all eternity as we allow ourselves to participate in this eternal throbbing of God's love and grace and care for us.